Hello and welcome back to GameSpot's coverage of E3 2016. I'm delighted to be joined by Mr. David Cage. Hey, uh, I you? guess the writer, director, creative lead. Yeah, of, whatever. Uh, Detroit <laughs> All these things human. at the same time, yeah. All of these things. Uh, great to have you here. Oh, uh, thank you for having me. Thanks so much. Great to see Detroit as well, uh, once again. Um, if you don't mind, though, I want to talk to you about uh, what, one of your earlier games, uh, one of sure. my favourite games, just briefly before we... Uh, uh, Omicron, The Nomad Soul. Oh, my God. Uh, Quantic Dream's first uh, You're that game. old? Yes, I know. Yeah, yeah. Oh I okay. The great hair I turned 30 <laughs> this year um, but I love that game and obviously er earlier this year we lost David Bowie in, in yep. January um, and that was I believe the only game that he was was in or the only I game think so, yeah. um, so what was it like working with him do you remember was there oh, fond absolutely. memories of it or? well it was my very first game really and um, yeah I remember the first time we met actually I mean uh, we were supposed to meet in uh, the publisher's office in London hmm. and um, I thought he would never come I thought all this was just, you know, would never <laughs> happen. And actually, it was like 10 minutes late. Right. And we were all looking at our watches, thinking, oh, he's never going to make it. And then 10 minutes later, he, he arrived, and he apologized for being late because <laughs> of the traffic. Oh, really? And he came with a young kid. Um, he was maybe 14 years old right. at the time. And he said, OK, this is my video game expert. This is my son, uh, Duncan Jones. Yes. Who became, of course, the director that we know. Yeah, of and Moon and, and of course, World of Warcraft. And, Warcraft. Yeah. and so it was <laughs> really funny because I met both at the same time. And yeah. uh, we had a wonderful collaboration together that lasted a year. Right. And he wrote about 12 original songs. And, um, and uh, I had the pleasure to direct him in studio because he would play two roles in the game. So yeah. it was, it's a fantastic experience, of course, as you can imagine. And he was a fantastic person. Right. That was actually how I found out about David Bowie. I, I, really? had, I had never found his music and then I remember walking into was it the bar where yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. band is playing for the first time and it takes control away from you and Absolutely. does the music video and then yeah. I was like what is this <laughs> yeah, yeah. my auntie found out and bought me a, a David Bowie album okay. then so I introduced you you did so David thank you so Bowie. much oh my god uh, for giving me the gift of <laughs> David Bowie and for to all of us my pleasure um, Quantic Dream obviously you've created a, a bunch of games since uh, Fahrenheit or um, Indigo Prophecy depending on right. what side of the Atlantic you live on Absolutely. Um, uh, the last one we played was uh, Beyond Two Souls, right. uh, another collaboration with a bunch of uh, famous uh, actors. Yes. Uh, one of the interesting things about Detroit, seeing it in initially, is that there doesn't seem to be any familiar faces. We don't have a Willem Dafoe, we don't have um, any sort of celebrity uh, in it, at least so far. I is that the case? It, well, you know, our goal has never been to look for the most uh, you know, famous people to get them in, in our games. It was just to find the right actor for the role. And uh, in this case, we worked with a bunch of uh, young but very talented actors. And the first one we introduced at Paris Games Week is the character is the character of Kara. Yes. Incarnated by um, a young actress called Valerie Curry. And uh, she was in a TV series called The Following recently. Mm. And she's a, she's a fantastic actress. And of course, she was Kara in the shorts that we did by in 2012. Yeah, a long time ago that. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So same actress. And uh, here at E3, we came with a new scene. And we absolutely wanted to come with a playable scene because, you know, with our games, each time we, we, we introduce a new game, the first question we get is, uh, how does it play? Uh, mm. Because it's, it's still quite mysterious for some people to know how you can play a story-driven game. So we wanted to come with this playable scene and introducing the character of Connor who is uh, incarnated by uh, another very talented actor called Brian Deckard. Uh, let's talk about some of your, I guess, influences that sort of create this world. Uh, what type of uh, world are we looking at here? Obviously, you know, very, you can talk about things like Blade Runner uh, in terms of the sort of like Android uh, sort of human relationship thing happening there. Um, but what type of world are we looking at in Detroit? How far in the future is it? What, what does Detroit look like? So Detroit, we call it a neo-noir thriller. It's set in a near future uh, in the city of Detroit, Michigan, of course. And uh, it's important for us that it's a near future. It's not sci-fi, so there's no flying car, no laser gun. Right. It's just all world, but 20 years from now. And this, this world, in this world, the technology uh, allowed the creation of androids that look, speak, move exactly like human beings, except they are just machines. Mm. So uh, they took most of human jobs, as you could expect. <laughs> and uh, so there are millions of them all across the country. And the story starts where when some of them start to show strange behaviors. Uh, some of them leave without any reason. Others kill themselves, which is very unusual for a yeah. machine. And others start to be aggressive against humans. And we're just at the very beginning. It's very few androids having these dysfunctions. Mm. And um, we are going to discover 
why and what happened, etc., etc. Well, what was important for me was to take a different angle than than most stories about androids. I didn't want to tell another story where the humans would be the good guys and they would need to face these evil androids and yes. who have a virus and we need to kill them before they kill us. It's been done before very well. I wanted to, to create a story where we would play the androids and see the world through their eyes and right. from their point of view and maybe they're the good guys and maybe we are the bad guys. Uh, it's always an interesting part of your games is the, or I suppose maybe the, the more modern ones, is that the idea of playing the story through multiple perspectives. Presumably that'll al also be the, the Absolutely, case. we play more than one character. We introduce again Kara and, and Connor is the second character that, that is always playable mm. and who knows, maybe there are more. <laughs> Wonderful, yeah, I'm sure we'll, we'll <laughs> find out over the coming months. Um, yeah, the demo you showed, I guess there's this thing when you, you the games that you create are always so s striking and so sort of like film-like that I guess maybe audiences sort of, we assume that they're incredibly linear and that there isn't much choice because that's the case for most video games that sort of take that route. Um, was there a sort of a very determined um, mission to sort of show that, okay, here is one small scene and this is like the various different ways in which it plays out? Absolutely, I mean, uh, we, we want to create an experience in which the player is not only the actor of the story, but he is the co-writer. So basically, based on his choices, his decision is going to tell his own story and his story is going to be different from, from someone else's mm. story. And uh, all this happens through gameplay. So we, don't, we didn't want to tell the story through cutscenes. We want the player to play, and as he plays, he tells mm. the story. And that was really our starting point and a real, real motto for, for every decision we make. We wanted to create the more, we, we call this bending, you know, for bending stories. Right. Uh, but it's branching narrative. And basically, we wanted to create the more bending game we have ever created at Quantic Dream. Right. Uh, well, is that always the mission for the next game? Because obviously, you know, with Heavy Rain, that was, that was the sort of motto to stop around uh, that was the mission it seemed and then with beyond two souls S similarly, but you know, in a different way, probably. Yeah. Y you know, game after game, we, we we don't like formulas in a way. We try to reinvent what we're doing. We try to challenge ourselves, and mm. we have the immense luxury of having time and support from from Sony to try things, to experiment, and and maybe fail, maybe succeed, maybe find something or find nothing. Mm. But at least we can explore and try. And um, each story you want to tell must find its own voice, its mm. own language in some, some way. And uh, so game after game, we try to find the best gameplay, the best interface that will better feed the story we want to tell. And for Detroit, it became very obvious from the beginning that that would, would be the best choice, having different points of view. Um, also having characters who can die, which is also something very interesting. Right. Because uh, I, I never felt comfortable with game over. Uh, right. in video games, to be honest, especially when they are story-driven. Because it's always a strange thing, this game over situations where you die and then we go back in time and you need to replay this again yeah. until you play the game the way the game designer wanted you to play. Which in a, in a, in a fighting game is fine or a shooting game, but in a story-driven game doesn't make any sense, right? Yeah. So what we tried to do was to give a narrative consequences to your um, failures mm. and um, make sure that maybe you will be injured, maybe you will lose something, maybe you will miss an information or, or something, or maybe ultimately your character can die. But there will be a logical consequence to your failure and consequence, significant consequences mm. on the narrative. Uh, your games are, you know, they're, they're, they're different as individuals. If you compare one to the other, they're different. But people know what a sort of a Quantic Dream game is. They know <laughs> where you're coming from. Um, why is it, do you think, that even though you've been making these games and they have been successful and selling and seem to be well critically uh, sort of acclaimed or received, why is no one else making these games? Is that weird to you? That I, like you know, I think the situation has changed a lot, to be honest with you, since we started. Because when, uh, when we really initiated this new genre, maybe with Indigo Prophecy, hmm. um, we were pretty much alone to believe in this story-driven game with branching narrative. And I remember very well that it was very challenging to convince publishers right. at the time to sign these kind of experiences because they said, well, there is no shooting in your game. What kind of game is it going to <laughs> right. be? So, um, we are now, you know, 10 years later, and I think things have changed a lot because now we can see some story-driven games arriving uh, and, uh, and uh, we can see, most of all, more and more storytelling in all kinds of games. Right. Even in shooters now, you have a very strong story and you have virtual actors and they try to mm. bring emotion. So Yeah, I mean, Heavy Rain was a game that sort of, you know, back then you guys were 
the first people, it seemed, doing this sort of like facial capture voice yeah. within the game. I mean, it seems like it's happening in every game now. Absolutely. Uh, is it easier for you guys now because there's like, it's not like you're creating this technology to put in your game. It's is it, it's more ubiquitous. Is it is it easier to do that now? Is the technology become sort of more? Yeah, available? you know, it's easier and harder. I, it's it's easier in that sense that because er, other people are doing it, then you know what the benchmark is and w what you want to improve compared to others where mm. where you were on your own. I mean, you were setting the benchmark by yourself, so yeah. it was like hard. But it's more challenging, of course, because now there is a lot of competition and there are some very, very talented and skillful people out there doing great things. So it's, uh, it's some pressure on the studio, but, but it's a very interesting challenge. And overall, I think it's a good thing for the industry right. as a whole that, uh, that we compete to tell the best story and have the best characters in our games. Uh, and does Sony support you, I imagine, quite well in, in, in this endeavor? I Absolutely. Mean I mean, uh, we came here... 10 years ago in 2006 and we had this uh, short technical demo that mm. we created that was called the casting that you can still find on YouTube and actually we never worked with Sony at the time and we just showed them this little piece and and they said okay we would you like to be on Sony's booth at E3 <laughs> I said, oh, yeah of course we, we that, that, that's a dream coming true mm. and um, they put the demo on their booth and it's been very successful and got very positive feedback and then they came back and say okay what do you want to do after that? Was it right. pitch them heavy rain? Was it was that the video of the lady in the kitchen? Absolutely, With the, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And uh, here we are, ten years later, and it's been a wonderful relationship, honestly, with them for ten years. Uh, they really supported us, always supported us, and uh, even in our crazy ideas, even mm. when the games are late or cost more than initially <laughs> right. planned, which never happens to <laughs> anyone in this industry. But still, they were very supportive and um, always pushing us for innovation and, and you know being creative and letting us what we wanted to do. I mean, total creative freedom, which is incredibly rare these days. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, and also so sort of as you as a, as a writer and director, like, you only get video games take a long time to make um, and you only get to make a certain amount within your lifetime yep. uh, was this a story that you always sort of wanted to tell is this one you've had on the back burner when you were making other games like Heavy Rain and Beyond did you always want to do your sort of take on on the android human relationship no, uh, but 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 I, I think the the you can only I can only carry one story at a time mm. and but I know that this is a story that I need to tell but um, it's, it's one thing at a time, and there is a moment where you, c you carry more stories in you, but there is a moment where there is one, right. and you know it's the right one. It's the one you're going to fight for over the next three, four years of your mm. life. And uh, you know that you cannot live without telling that specific story. Mm. And it, it slowly grows in you, it's, and it becomes something obvious at some point, and you know you have to do it. Mm. And I guess I've got a lot of questions, sort of, I, I'm sure you won't be telling us too much about it, but about, about Detroit. I mean, the word Detroit in America as well means something, it, you know, that you can't sort of th think about that without, you know, thinking about race relations and sort of like, um, I guess, like socioeconomic issues and things like that. And obviously, we were talking briefly before we went live about, you know, to, sort of what's happening in, in Europe at the moment as well. D do you feel like you want to tell those types of stories within your games? Is there any of that in Detroit uh, itself or sort of... Cause that's, it's, it's a difficult one. It's like, do you want to have the responsibility or burden of talking about these things? You know, I, I chose Detroit because I was very fascinated by the history of this city. It was an industrial giant in the 20th century, yeah. and then it went through very hard times, and now it's trying to be reborn again uh, somehow. It has also a fantastic history of, as you said, racial you know, hmm. issues. Um, the cultural aspect is also amazing with the Motown and all the great right. artists yeah, of course. coming yeah. from Detroit. So it's a fantastic place. But it's also a great city with a great history. And uh, this idea of, of being very high and losing everything and coming back right. is so strong. And it's such a human story yeah. somehow. So th that was the starting point for getting interested in, in Detroit. And then we said, OK, we cannot write about Detroit without going there mm. I mean of course you can go on the internet and grab some pictures and then you know Google Earth it and, and, <laughs> y and you there are lots of, of ways today yeah, today. I mean, yeah. Uh, but the thing is that you don't feel the place you don't know the people so you, we, we traveled there spent some time um, there of course we visited the abandoned factories and mm. the abandoned churches that everybody knows in uh, all the urban fields type of areas 
but at the same time we uh, we saw some wonderful things mm. we met some incredible people and um, the Fox Theater for example in Detroit right. is one of the most amazing place I've seen and it's it's right in the center of Detroit and it's incredible and and the people there are full of energy and they're struggling and they're fighting but they they are revitalizing the mm. city in a very interesting way and all this combined we came back from Detroit really thinking yeah this is the place where we want the story to happen but this is a very sensitive thing because and, and th that was also very important to us is that if you choose a real place yeah you need to do it in a very respectful way because this city has its own I history there are people living there and they they love their city or this is the place where they live i mean mm. you need to pay attention to that and be respectful and not just use what you want to use for your game yeah. and throw everything away so we we'll try to do it, um, and and we'll see. Uh, but um, I hope that people in Detroit will feel proud mm. of this game and, and and the way we use their city. Lovely. Um, last question, David. Thank you so much for coming on and talking. Talking to us. a lot, right? <laughs> no, it's great. I, I mean, I could talk to you all day. It's always fascinating to, to speak uh, to somebody like you. Um, I, last question: What games are you playing right now? What do you have much time to play games at the moment? Are you very busy? What have you played in 2016? Uh, oh, I played a bunch of things. A little bit less this year because the Detroit is taking pretty much yeah. all my time. At the moment, I'm playing a, a little game on iOS. Little game, great game. It's called uh, Human Resource Machine. Okay. <laughs> and it's sounds uh, like, that sounds like work a bit. It, it sounds like work, but it's actually a very fun game to um, be initiated to programming. Right. Though that sounds very boring, described like that, but actually it's a very fun game. And if you like puzzle games on iOS, you should check it out because it's really surprising in many ways. Excellent. There you go. Game <laughs> recommendation from David Cage himself. Thank you so much, sir, <laughs> hey, for coming thank on. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Uh, looking forward to seeing more of thank uh, you. Detroit Becoming. Thank you. Well.